Hello, I'm Debbie Kitterman, and welcome to Dare to Hear the Podcast, where we equip you and challenge you to dare to hear the voice of God. Well, I am super excited to introduce to you uh, Glenn Berto and his book, Why Am I Not Healed When God Promised. So Glenn Berto is an evangelist, teacher, author, and senior pastor of the House Modesto, which has more than 11,000 members and was highlighted by Outreach Magazine as the second fastest growing church in America. Glenn and his wife, Deborah, have three children and seven grandchildren, and they live in Modesto, California. Well, Glenn, welcome to Dare to Hear the Podcast. Thank you, Debbie, and it's exciting to be with you, and I thank you for what you do. Well, thank you. I was so excited when I saw your book is coming out, and it actually released on June 30th, so that was yesterday. So I want to just tell people as you're listening to our podcast, go get a copy of his book and we'll tell you at the end of the show how you can do that. Because this was a book that I was so excited, Glenn, about coming out because of this last year of losing people close to us and we were really pursuing healing. And so I thought, okay, this that just resonated in my spirit of why am I not healed? Why did um, this not happen in some of these people's lives uh, that we were pursuing healing for? So I was super excited to get a copy of your book and to read it. And um, in fact, I got such an advanced copy that I actually don't have one to show people, um, but it is um, a beautiful beautiful cover and they just need to go get a copy on Amazon. Okay. But what I wanted to ask you is why this book at this time when you wrote it now, because when you wrote it, we're going to talk a little bit about the after, um, the after part. So, but, um, at the time that you wrote this book, why, why was this book on your heart? Well, the, I think there were several books chosen, uh, approached me and, uh, and uh, I, I really wasn't thinking about writing a book, but the the physical area, sickness and so forth has, as you have said in your family, I think of the people and listeners and people that are watching have the same issues and we have puzzling questions. We don't have answers. Uh, we don't want to hear that uh, the old adage that I just didn't have enough faith to believe. Because as you know, with your dad and, and, and my family and everybody that's watching here, it, it's not a faith issue of why they didn't recover, why they didn't come back, why they died, so forth. Uh, there could be other things. And I, I felt from a pastor's point of view, because I deal with and you deal with uh, people in our churches that are sick coming every week. They're dealing with diabetes, dealing with heart disease, dealing with cancer. They're sitting in our churches. So and so gets healed over there. So and so gets healed over there. Why am I not getting healed? And God's promised me the same scriptures, same thing. No respect to persons. So why is that not happening? <clears throat> I go back to my uh, my initial. Right when I was saved, Evan, when I first got saved, I was the only person in my family to had ever been saved in my life. Uh, no one has ever been saved in my family. No yeah. one. Uh, I didn't have a Bible. Never seen a Bible. Never read a Bible. Uh, I was never asked if I w- about the Lord to be saved till I was a freshman in college. And so I grew up in a non-Christian home in a New Orleans party. I'm in Louisiana and everything's Mardi Gras every, every day. So everybody's party, everybody drinking, everybody gets drunk, everybody cursing everybody out, and then they make up in the morning. And so this, is, this was my family. And I end up going, I'm playing college football at a scholarship and, and play football in college. So I play football. My quarterback's a Pentecostal preacher out of all things, a preacher's kid. <laughs> Ends up leading me to the Lord in my third year there in my dormitory room. And I am totally radically changed. Okay. What happens after that, I'm real close to my grandmother in New Orleans. My family thinks I'm crazy. I've lost my mind. Uh, uh, that am I going to grow long hair and go in a park and put a sign up when the world's going to end? My mom tells me, uh, you know, like, are you going to be one of those end time people, crazy people out there in the park? I said, no, mom, I'm not going to do that. Uh, <clears throat> but what happened is my grandmother in her seventies had cancer and she was dying in the hospital. Mm-hmm. Well, of course they put her in the hospital and take care of her, do everything like this. And the Lord says for me to go pray. And I'm a young Christian. So I go, down to New Orleans, I end up in her room by myself. My grandmother just loves her grandchildren. Oh, Sha, I can't believe you came, little Glenn. What, what do you want to? I said, I said, Momo, I want to pray for you. I, I'm, I'm like, I'm maybe a year as a Christian. I don't know, a, I don't know a scripture. I don't know healing. 
Yeah. I just didn't want my grandma to die, you know, and I hear that, oh, you can heal and uh, God can heal. So I went in and she goes, oh, I said, well, I came to pray. Oh, whatever you want to do, you just do it. She didn't even know what I wanted to do. So I ended up praying for my grandmother and said in Jesus name. And then I left a couple of days later, I'm at my mom's house and a phone call comes from the hospital and they says, we don't understand what's happened to your mother. She's eating, she's hungry. And, um, we can't find any cancer. So my whole family that's not saved, nobody's a Christian, even my grandmother's not saved. They're all standing around the, whole, the, the hospital bed and they're all bragging about the hospital, how great this hospital is. Oh, the, I knew the doctors are the greatest doctors in the world at this hospital. We put mama in the right place there and these, these doctors are great. And my grandmother, who's not even a Christian, says stops the whole family. Says, no, no, Shad, that's not what happened. That's not what happened at all. And little Glenn came in. Little Glenn came in and he prayed for me and he mentioned a guy named Jesus. And he said, from that point on, I started getting hungry and I started feeling better. The hospital had nothing to do with it. <laughs> so I went from like a weirdo to a, I'm, a, I'm the healer now in the family. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I saw that happen. And, and that was Debbie not having any real understanding of, total scripture, but God took my little faith that I had because I really, <clears throat> I really made a change uh, from my, from the way I grew up and my life that I had and my family that I have. I think God just honored me and just says, you know what? The boy needs some help here. Let, this is something I can do for him. <clears throat> As I came through the book uh, comes from several things. My, my, my first daughter, when she was 15 years of age, I, when she was 14, I said, baby, what do you want to do? I said, what do you feel God's telling you to do? She goes, I want to be a nurse. Mm -hmm. I said, well, then that's what you're going to be. One year later, she has rheumatoid arthritis, totally handicapped, totally mm -hmm. handicapped. She's on meth methotrexate, prednisone on the whole thing. And uh, <clears throat> she, she finishes school and she does. I said, she goes, dad, I can't move my hands. I said, you, God said you're going to be a nurse. She actually became a nurse with rheumatoid arthritis, but she could not work the 12 hour days because it was too hard on her. Mm -hmm. uh, she's now 25, 26 years into rheumatoid arthritis. She's totally handicapped. She lives in Florida. And <clears throat> we have, as you have, and we have known, and people that are watching and hearing this, prayed for a loved one. It's not a lack of faith. I don't have a lack of faith. It's my own child. Mm -hmm. And I, I see the pain. I see her hurting. I've taken her every place there could be, taken any kind of money. We would do anything for our kids. I did that. We're doing all of this. Before that happened, my 33-year-old sister, I only had one sister, no brother. She dies of ovarian cancer mm -hmm. uh, at 33 with three little kids. And I was in Louisiana pastoring at the time, and the hospital was right across the street. And, and you know, what was ironic about it is that it was on, it was on the Friday of, of Palm Sunday. And my message for that Sunday was the miracles of Jesus. I was going to talk about all the miracles that he had done. And my sister dies on a Friday before that. And I'm like, how am I going to talk about all the miracles? And I had one here, God, that you could, you could have easily done. And I was very puzzled by that. I was, I was just like, like some of us are, I, we don't understand. We've done everything we need to do. And I'm like, God, get, can you give me a break here? I'm in the ministry. I'm doing what I can. I'm praying. <clears throat> it could be a tremendous testimony. I speak out. I bring her with me and let her share a story. You know, I mean, I had all this down and she had three children that were little and it didn't make sense mm. at all of why that happened. I, I, I don't know if I still have an answer in a sense for that, Yeah, but good. Well, uh, I was going to say that was the thing that as I was reading your book, I was like, because the afterward, I'm like, wait a minute, he turned in this book before this, this event happened. So we'll get there to my listeners. We're going to get there because that was such a powerful thing from different um, members of your family as they were talking about that in the afterward, after you had already turned in this manuscript. Um, but when, when I was reading this, it, it helped me because I have been, um, 
you know, this last year and a half, we we lost, um, I lost an aunt, I lost my best friend's husband, and uh, we were really close to him. We lost my dad. Um, there, My niece had a, a stillborn baby with some stuff. And so there's been a lot of things like personally that are connected to me. So I was like, okay, so it's not that I don't have enough faith. And you actually talk about the faith and you you bring up questions like, well, does God really want to heal me? And um, I loved this this piece that you said. You talk about faith as an action, and you take it from Romans ten seventeen. You know, faith comes through hearing, right? But then you take it the next step further, but says, <laughs> um, if we if we're sitting in church and we're listening to the preaching, but we do nothing about it, are we really hearing? And I thought. Oh, so can we talk about that, about faith being in action? And uh, you had like a whole story around that. And I thought that that was really well put because I think sometimes we think, oh yes, we our faith is in action, but we actually don't follow through with the obedience part of that. So can you talk just a little bit around that? I mean, I, that's, 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 you're, you're exactly right in that faith comes by hearing. Hearing is, hearing is a word of obey. It's not just what we think of just hearing with my ears of hearing what the preacher says, uh, because not knowledge. Um, uh, well, no, let me say it this way. Truth doesn't make you free. Mm-hmm. We would think truth makes you free and it doesn't. It says you shall know the truth. So truth unknown does not bring freedom to you. Mm-hmm. So what you don't know in that Bible, you don't benefit from because you don't know it. And just to have knowledge of something that, oh, I have knowledge of something. There are people that have PhDs that are really dumb in a lot of areas. They have knowledge, but knowledge lived becomes wisdom. If you don't live out knowledge, you can't have any wisdom. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and the whole thing of faith is just like your child. I tell my, I tell my son, I said, I want you to go out and, uh, uh, and take the garbage out. Okay, Dad, I'll take it out. I said, you hear me? Yeah, I heard you. And then I look out the front. I don't see the garbage outside. And then our thing, what we say is, did you hear me, son, tell you? And what we're saying is, did you obey what I said? And so God's word is not just a hearing word. It's an obeying word. And I have to obey many times when I don't understand the outcome. I don't see how it's going to happen. I mean, if Jesus told you, go, go, I'm going to spit in some mud and I'm going to put it on your eye. What are you doing putting mud on my, he's crazy, he's crazy, you know, okay. Right. We would, we would think it's the craziest thing in the world because it's not something, it's not fitting into my understanding or the way I think God should, you need to get rid of the way you think God should do it or perform it and the way he may bring it to pass and just let God just do what he does and just trust him in the steps to get there. He wants your faith. He wants your your undivided obedience and and totally all in on this thing. And God says, watch me do it. And many times what happens, Debbie, is that we don't understand that God doesn't move until we're in the middle of a battle. Mm -hmm. He doesn't move before you get into the battle. He moves when you get into it. Uh, Elijah didn't have fire come down from heaven until he was in the middle of the battle. Uh, We have Joshua. The, the, The angels are throwing ice rocks down, killing more of the enemy. Then they killed. He said, I killed you. I killed you. But I'm standing in a desert and they got ice on this guy's head. I don't know what happened to this guy. I don't know what happened here. But God did not go ahead and move until they were in the middle of the battle. And you become, you move into an advantage in that. Then God said, though, with my sister, when my sister died, I actually, I was, I was so distraught over that at 33 years of age. And here I, she was 33. I was older than her. It's the only sibling I had. And she, she died of cancer. And uh, I remember going in my closet and I, I remember having a good talk with God like we always have. Us good yeah. Christians, we, right. we have a nice, nice face-to-face talk with him. Like, you could have done yeah. something. You could have turned this around. You have the ability. I read what you have to say. I quoted what you have to say. And I'm thinking at that time, I'm going to push God away because I'm just going to let him have it, let him know how I feel. What he did for me, Debbie, he grabbed me, he held me, and he was holding on to me. He goes, tell me what you think of me. And I just tell him what I thought of him. I just told him, I said, look, I, hey, if it was me, I would have done it this way. I would have done this and done this, and I would have raised her up, and I would have done I asked you, and you didn't do this. 
And I kept I talking, and then eventually I just started crying. And he goes, are you through? He goes, I said, yeah. He said, I still love you. I said, I'll explain it to you one day. He said, I'll tell you about it. He said, and it's going to make sense. You're going to understand it. You don't understand it now. But he said, trust me. He said, uh, uh, it's okay. She's okay, and we're going to work this out. And I remember at a funeral, Deb, uh, Debbie, I, uh, I, was, I was older, and I, I remember standing there doing her funeral, and I looked up, and I said, Linda, I said, I beat you in everything. I was stronger than you. I was older than you. I graduated earlier than you. I beat you, and I was faster than you. And I said, you finally beat me at something. Yeah. You finally beat me to heaven, didn't you? Huh? Mm -hmm. And you beat me there. And it just kind of was comforting to know that, you know, as we know, that heaven just gets sweeter. And, uh, you know, we have, when our loved ones go there, we're going to see them again. And, and we're going to be there again. But uh, I, I can't get, I, 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 here you are as a pastor and you're having to preach faith and you, and the same things that happen to those that are watching and those that are listening is the same thing that happens to us too. So what do we do? And that's where there's that blind faith at times where I'm not going to have it written out to me and it's not going to be an easy, just this or that. Uh, and we're not going to know. There's just some things we're not going to know, but God God has confirmed in me, trust me, when you do, and I do tell you when you come see me, you're going to have an understanding. Mm -hmm. That's so good. I There was a couple things too, like you had this one quote, you, you talked about the word of God and the will of God being synonymous. And then you said, if you want to know the will of God, do um, and do the will, if you want to know the will of God and do the will of God, then I need you to know the word of God. And that I was like, that's so true, right? Because we, I think as believers, we say, oh yeah, we know what the Bible says because we can pull out those one line quotes of stuff. But really we have to know everything about who God is. And the only way to do, to know the will of God and do the will of God is to be in the word of God. And you laid that out so beautifully in um, that chapter of the book of really get in there, the will of God and um, the word of God are synonymous with one another. It's really the way that you really take the uh, faith and it becomes the currency of the kingdom of knowing what God says and knowing his heart. And even though things might not turn out the way we think they should here on this side of eternity, that we still uh, trust God and we push in. And now I liked, I liked this one thing and I want to kind of go in this direction. So we'll see, we might have to take this over into another episode, but you were talking about in one of the chapters, you talked about how um, Satan is the one who steals your health. And then you had this, God is not the author of evil disease or destruction. Your problems are part of your prophetic destiny. And in fact, there was a couple times um, throughout the book that you talk about that what we're going through is part of the destiny that God has for us. Yeah. And, um, I often think of people that are like, you know, you have those to the far extreme that says, well, well, God never promised that he would heal you. He, he can, he might, but it's really ultimately his will. And, um, and so, and then you have those that are like, no, the word of God says this. And so, um, and then there's people that are in the middle and I loved the way you talked about it because Somebody had said to me, um, they had lost somebody and they said, well, God's word never promises that he will heal us. And I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure that when you read scripture, that this is what it is. And, I, and then they're like, so I don't have enough faith. And I said, oh, I don't think that it has anything to do with your faith. But I yeah. said, there's a lot of things at play that we don't even understand in, in all of that. And so can you just kind of talk around that piece right there? Well, Debbie, God can take, God's the only one that can take something bad make it worse and call it a promotion. Yeah, that's so true. That's <laughs> you know, so true. And, and that's what he's doing with this pandemic. He's actually taking something bad and then it gets worse and we have more deaths that are horrible. But then God is also unveiling the church and moving the church to be out of the building. Instead of being the lights of the church, they become the lights of the world. Like he said, we've been the lights of the church long enough. And so God has a purpose in that. And the will of God is always to say, see, see, even with, we go back to my sister and uh, there is no death. As we know, we go from life to life yeah. and, uh, and, and, and there is a healing. I mean, she's healed right now because she was so such in bad shape. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I don't know if she could have recovered from where she was at or anything like this, but, uh, you know, the the will of God is going to be a puzzling thing. That's why this book, I think, is so relevant in the sense that it will explain some things to you. It it will explain different areas that I, I've thought of that, thought of that, thought of that, but I haven't thought of that. And it's just a broader picture of some of the some of the questions that we have that are that are that at night we just think about, I want an answer. I want an answer. I want an answer. There's no way we're going to get all the answers. But uh, one thing I I know this is that the word of God, as you were talking about the word of God and we're talking about faith, well, guess what the food for faith is? It is the word. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the word, your faith cannot be built. All that's being built is your willpower or your your ability to say no, which has nothing to do with any of your miracles. You will have to have the word in your life, and the word is what builds faith. And if you don't put the word in your life, you have nothing to stand on. I have also found that the stronger, now listen to this connection, the stronger I make my family, the greater my protection will be against evil, sickness, and so forth is that my family, the order of my family, the the greatest people that I could have pray for me are my blood relatives. You know, if the blood covers, well, the blood's powerful in a sense. And and my family, as we'll talk about later on, where those of you to watch the next segment is that I died eight times here. So Mm -hmm. you'll hear a story on, I I should not even be talking to you, Debbie, right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it, it really, they, they don't understand. It's not just, this is a Lazarus full blown miracle they're going to hear about. And I had nothing to do with it. And when it's that kind of a miracle, doctors don't have anything to do with it. No, they do not. It's God just does something, but everything, like you said, you're prof- you have a prophetic destiny and you are well aware of that. You teach that there is a prophetic destiny that God has all things that are in your life are going to work out to move you into your prophetic destiny of what he's ultimately called you to do. Now we have our own map on how we want to make it work. And I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen. God says, no, I need to use that. And I need to use that too. And we wished he would not have to do that. But hindsight is our greatest teacher in a sense that we learn from, I didn't know it at the time, but I saw what God did in me to make me stronger. Uh, Authority is something that God wants to put in your life. You cannot have authority without adversity. You're going to have to walk through things. When a general of the military walks in a room with medals all across his chest, he didn't get that in peacetime. He got that in wartime. Mm-hmm. And so you don't get your accolades, you don't get your awards until you're walking through a war zone and you're standing up and at the end of it, you might be bloody, you might be cut, you might be, you might be down to just a little switchblade fighting, but you're still standing and you're still trusting God. And God says, I think I can use you in a greater capacity because you're going to be scary to the devil and his demons when you begin to pray. And so the authority, and we'll hear this later, how powerful and important what I'm talking about, authority is, and most Christians don't understand that without that authority, you can't move a pebble, much less a mountain. Yeah. And that, but you have to go through things. You've got to go through warfare. If I, if I cut, you know, if you see the spiritual inside of me, you would see cuts, you would see bruises, you would see broken bones spiritually, you would see things that I had gone through in my life to where I stand today. I'm humbled. I'm broken. I totally trust God. I believe God can do anything. I mean, if he resurrected me, he can do anything. Mm -hmm. And I just have the faith to believe that. And whatever happens after I have prayed with authority, Debbie, as you know, whatever happens, that's God's will. And I'm accept that. I'm a trust that he knows more than me on this subject. Yeah. Yeah, we we do. We have to come back to God. We trust you in it all. You said um, later on in the book, I think in chapter ten or something, you said this. You said Christians um, are in a spiritual uh, spiritual war every single day, yet they're so distracted by life, and that the first question that they often ask is, "Why me?" When they're going through struggles, 
And then you said this, you said there's no guarantee in the Bible that life is going to be perfect. Um, that once you accept Jesus, but your guarantee is that God will help us make it through the floods and the fire. And I thought that that was so good because it's so true. I think people often take Jeremiah 29, 11, I've done it, you know, but these are the plans God has for you, which are absolutely true, but he's going to work them out to get you to your prophetic destiny. And so I've heard, you know, arguments on each side. Well, okay, but all these bad things are happening. And then we look at Job and we look at all these things, but we are in a war every day, but we're distracted by the life, I, the life um, that we're living. And I think that's what this pandemic is kind of doing, right? It's kind of making the main thing, the main thing, bringing it back to the word, bringing it back to your relationship with the Lord, because that's what really matters. Because when all else is taken away and things begin to go um, around us and are out of our control, what do we have to stand on? We have to go back to the word. Yeah. And yeah. Your warfare is connected, Debbie, as you're saying. Yeah. Warfare is connected to our walk with God. Yeah. We are going to go through things. Even though it's your, we would want to ask, well, if God promised me this, why is it going to be hard to get it? If he's promised it, it doesn't sound right. Well, go back and look at the Israelites then. They had a promise, but they had to fight. And even when they got into their promise, Joshua is still fighting. Mm -hmm. He's still having a fight. And God says, I will be with you in the battle. He didn't, you know, he's with you in peacetime, but he's also with you in the battle. And to get your promise, you're going to have to learn to fight. Yeah, that's so good. And I think that we think, oh, no, as a believer, everything should just be, oh, clear path and God's going to move everything out. But it's really in that battle that we begin to learn who he is. It's, it's how we begin to stand and get our spiritual strength so that when things come at us, we can say, but I'm not moved because I know who God is. I know his word. I can stand upon that. And God is fighting for me, even in the midst of the battle. He didn't promise it would be easy, but he promised that he would see him, see me through to the other side. Um, so Glenn, this is really good. I'd love to carry this over because like you said, we did not even talk about what really happened to you that actually happened after you turned in this manuscript, which I think is a testament really of your, your family living out what you wrote in the book. And yeah. so um, I want to carry this over, but before we end this episode, could you tell my uh, viewers and listeners how they can connect with you and how they can get a copy of your book? Well, we, uh, Glenn Berto, you can go to glennberto.com. You can type in my name, G L E N, and then that's B E R T E A U, B E R T E A U, Berto. Uh, the book is on Amazon. The book is also on glennberto.com. You can go on Instagram, just type in my name. It's on YouTube, uh, it's on Facebook. And you will find where you can get the book there. Amazon will have it. And uh, I, I tell you what, it's going to be something that I don't think, Debbie, that has been maybe dealt with or approached in the sense of the realness I've experienced in my own personal life, in my own family, with my wife, with my daughter, with my sister. So you say, are you qualified to write about, you know, uh, sickness and, and healing? and things? Yeah. And I'll, I'll next segment, we'll talk about people won't believe what I went through yeah. and what God did, but this is going to give people a lot of faith. Yeah, it is. It, it increased mine. It gave me some of the answers for some of the questions that I was asking about my my own family members, my dad, you know, at first I kind of felt like, oh, did I let my dad down? Cause I told him I will fight with you till the end. And, you know, just kind of in retrospect, you go back and go, could I have done something different? Was there something more I could do? And so reading your book, I was just like, oh, get, I got it. Okay. This is great. And I did have that real conversation with God. Um, you know, okay, God, here I go. I am going to tell you exactly how I feel about it. And he did the same thing to me that he did with you. He comforted me. He yeah. showed me. And, you know, he said, he, he just, he just really spoke to me in that moment. And I know where my dad is. I know his yeah. salvation is secure. And I know that in the time that we had with him from the time of his diagnosis to the time he passed, that, that there was a lot of healing that happened in my dad's life that he wasn't ready for before yeah. this happened. And so, and, and really just kind of the beautiful way that the Lord allowed me to 
to walk through that with my own father. And so that was really great. So can you, um, as we end this episode, could you just kind of pray us out of this episode and then we'll pick you up next week? Lord, I pray that confusion, uh, a troubled mind, uh, hurt, being angry with you, uh, all of these things are natural in a sense because when we are dealing with sickness or a lost loved one, it does hurt. But Lord, uh, those are the times where you comfort us in times of need. You're an ever-present help in our troubled hearts. And God, I pray for the family that's watching and listening in Jesus' name, that you will wrap your arms around them as you've done with Debbie and I in our situations. You'll do that right now with them. Bring healing to them. Bring comfort to them. Bring peace to them. And in Jesus' name, I pray that, Lord, they will sense how much you love them, you care, and you're involved in their situations. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that, Pastor Glenn. Well, thank you for listening to Dare to Hear the Podcast, where we encourage you to dare to hear the voice of God. I'm Debbie Kitterman. If you were encouraged in any way, we would be honored if you would subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast listening station or our YouTube channel. And that we'd ask that you would also do us a favor and share this episode so that we can get the message out um, by Glenn Berto and about healing and what the word of God says about it. And so share this with your friends, your family, anyone who will listen to you about this, because this is a powerful book and it did release yesterday, June 30th. So go to Amazon or any major online retailer and you're going to find a Glenn's book there. Get yourself a copy of Why Am I Not Healed When uh, God promised because it is a powerful tool that you're going to want to have in your hands and in your arsenal because when you go through the fire, God will be with you and you need to have the word of God and declarations to stand upon. And Glenn has that in his book. So again, Glenn, thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to next week's episode with you. So hang tight. Oh